Hello everyone, in this lecture I'm going to talk about chapter 5, link layer, uh, which focuses on the, the second layer of computer networks. The goal in this chapter is to understand the principles behind link layer services like error detection, error connection, and how to share a broadcast channel, and uh, multiple access protocols, and the details of those protocols, and also uh, how link layer addressing works and how it's different from uh, network layer addressing using IPv4 or IPv6 and also uh, we'll talk about Ethernets and uh, other uh, second layer protocols So let's not forget that link layer is in the second layer of computer networks and uh, it has a big responsibility. Its responsibility is to transfer datagram which were packets in the third layer from one node to the physically adjacent node over a link. So that's an important point here. Uh, the responsibility of link layer protocols is to transfer only one hop from every node to its physically adjacent node over one single link. Uh, that being said, in network layer, if you remember, uh, or even in transport layer, the, uh, the uh, responsibility and the goal of uh, protocols were to create a end-to-end -end connection however in link layer we focus on one link one hop and uh, the responsibility to transfer datagram from one node to its physically adjacent node another important point is in the second layer we call the packets frames so frame is used uh, for layer 2 packets uh, for the layer 3 packets, we used datagram, if you remember from the previous lecture. And for the fourth layer packets, we use segments. And the fifth layer packets are called messages. In a computer network, there may be different protocols running on different links. So the link layer protocol is specific to a link and you know a datagram in the third layer may be transferred by different link protocols over different links uh, through a path okay and for example one of the links might be wired the other might be wireless one be uh, one might uh, run ethernet the other might run 802.11 or other uh, link layer protocols. And each link layer protocol provides uh, different services. For example, you can think of uh, link layer protocols like uh, transportation mode, either it's uh, using a car or using trains or using uh, f uh, using a flight and datagrams are like uh, tourists and you know transport segments are like uh, communication links and also uh, the routing algorithm which specifies the path is like travel agent so that's uh, the transportation analogy to uh, illustrate the position of link layer in computer networks. So the first job of link layer protocol is to frame the datagram uh, by adding header and also another important service that link layer protocols uh, provide is that they provide reliability of delivery between adjacent nodes. So we have already talked about 
how reliability in data transfer may happen in chapter 3. In this chapter also we talk a little bit about a few techniques for reliability. Another service that link layer protocol provides is flow control. Some link layer protocols provide flow control which means pacing between adjacent sending and receiving nodes and also uh, some link layer services provide the error detection and or error correction services. Error detection means uh, detecting that an error uh, has occurred because of many reasons like noise or signal and uh, attenu attenuation and you know error correction means the receiver of a noisy data or uh, the detection uh, the, the receiver of a data that detects error uh, identifies and correct the uh, bit error or bit errors without uh, resorting to retransmission. Also, some link layer protocols uh, provide the uh, possibility of a half duplex or full duplex communications. Full duplex means uh, both parties can talk at the same time in different, pos in opposite directions. However, half duplex means while one transfer direction is going on the other direction in the, uh, the, the, uh, the data cannot be uh, transferred in the opposite direction so although in half to place nodes at both uh, nodes at both ends can uh, transmit data but they cannot transmit data at the same time in each host uh, and you know router link layer is implemented uh, in adapter uh, and you know the adapter is also called uh, NIC network interface card which uh, the computers treat them like another peripheral device like hard disk so here is what happens uh, when a frame uh, leaves the sending host and receive uh, and uh, arrives at the receiving host. In the sending side, the datagram is in encapsulated into a frame. As you see here, this is the datagram, and the blue ones are the header for that datagram and how the uh, datagram can be encapsulated into a frame. And obviously, the sending side adds some error checking bits for the sake of. Uh, error detection or maybe error correction in the receiving side and also if uh, the link layer protocol provides reliable data transfer or flow control uh, the sender uh, adds some uh, necessary fields in the header of uh, the datagram uh, I'm sorry the header of the frame uh, and then send it uh, through the physical link to the receiving side and in the receiving side and the receiver looks for errors and see whether uh, reliability of the transfer has been preserved or not and then uh, it does some uh, you know uh, interactions with the sender regarding flow control if flow control is one of the services that link layer protocol provides and finally it extracts datagram and passes uh, the datagram to the upper layer of the the receiving side. Let's focus on error detection first. You know, uh, error detection in the second layer may be accompanied by error correction. So we might have only error detection or we have both error detection and error correction. Error detection and correction bits are added to the uh, link layer headers sometimes uh, so that it, uh, it will help the receiver to detect and or correct uh, the error bit. Uh, let's assume that you have a datagram in the third floor and you want to send it through a bit error 
prone link as you see here and to do this you have to first add uh, something to it and the thing that we add to it is called EDC uh, error detection and correction bits uh, this chunk of data is like um, a number of bits that is um, uh, added to the, uh, the original data and then it is passed through this uh, unreliable and bit error prone uh, link and then in the receiving side when the receiver receives uh, the packet it may receive a different data and it may receive a different EDC part um, but we should, this is our task or this is the link layers task uh, to find out whether the, an error has occurred based on the values of D prime and EDC prime or not if an error um, has detected then you have to uh, try to correct it or if you can't you can simply drop it and ask uh, the sender to send it again or if there is no error in the received data you can simply extract data graph from it and pass it to the third layer one of the very famous methods for error detection and error correction is called uh, parity che checking uh, here we first talk about error detection how to detect error with the uh, single uh, parity bit uh, this is the simplest uh, form of parity checking and then we'll talk about the two-dimensional bit parity which is not only considered as a error detection algorithm but it is also an error correction algorithm so uh, let's first start with the single bit parity uh, you know parity means uh, being even or not right so uh, the parity bit uh, shows whether there are even number of ones in the data or odd number of ones uh, if you count the number of ones in this data the number of ones would be three it would be nine right so we have nine uh, ones in this uh, data and uh, obviously nine is an odd number now uh, the parity bit sh should uh, show zero if it's even and should show odd if it's i'm, I'm sorry it should show one if it's odd so here the parity bit is zero which means that uh, the data bit has to be even and that's how we can detect the error we say if there there is no error in this uh, data transfer we should have a one here because we have nine ones in the data therefore the number of uh, ones are odd therefore we should have a one in the parity bit since it is zero it means that uh, there is at least one bit error okay so if you want to say it more precisely either we have one bit error or three bits error or five bits error or seven bits error it means that we have odd number of bits that have been flipped while being transferred over the network so that being said if two bits get flipped in a, a connection then the single bit parity is unable to detect such error it only detects the errors if uh, then an odd number of bits has been uh, flopped has been uh, you know uh, uh, flipped uh, so assuming that only one single uh, bit has a chance to be flipped then uh, this is a good uh, error detection so solution but still it cannot 
correct the error. Why? Because in this example, for example, we know that one of the bits has been flipped, but, but we don't know which one of them. We have so many bits here, but we don't know which one has been flipped. So there is no error correction in this algorithm. But in a two-dimensional bit parity, uh, we have the ability to both detect and correct a single bit error. Let's see how it works. Uh, the same concept of uh, parity bit, but here we use multiple of them. Not only one parity bit we use. Uh, in this case, we use I plus j plus one different uh, parity bits so the, the uh, you know the technique here is to uh, write the data into a two-dimensional binary array so here we have a, a two-dimensional array we have a matrix of uh, you know i columns and j I'm sorry, I rows and J columns. So the, we have a total of I times J um, bits in the data. And for every row and for every column, we calculate the uh, parity bit in the uh, sender, which means that the sender uh, counts the number of ones in this row. If it's odd, then it uh, sets the uh, parity bit of this row equal to 1. If uh, we have even number of 1s, then it set the parity bit equal to 0. Same thing for the second row, third row, all the way to the last row, which is the ith row. And also, then uh, the next step, the sender, you know, uh, counts the number of 1s in the first column. If the, the number of 1s is odd, then he se it sets uh, the parity bit reg uh, regarding the first column equal to 1. If the number of 1s is even, then it set the parity bit equal to 0. Same thing for all other columns. And uh, finally, um, we'll get to uh, the process of uh, finding uh, the error. Not only detecting er the error, but finding which bit has been flipped. So let's assume that uh, this is uh, the data in the form of a two-dimensional array plus uh, parity column and parity row. Uh, also note that there's a zero here, which means there are two ones in this column and two ones in this column and the number of ones are even. So when this data is received by the receiver, Receiver checks to see whether uh, the parity bits are okay, like the check that we did here. It counts the number of ones and see if the number of ones are even or not. If the number of ones are even, then the parity bit must be zero. Otherwise, it must be one. Uh, if the number of ones are odd, it should be one. If this is not the case, then it uh, it concludes that some error has happened. So in the case that only a single bit error uh, exists in the receiving data, like this case, we are able to detect and correct a single bit error. How it's possible uh, when a bit like this one gets flipped, then uh, the parity error happens in this row and in this column because the, uh, the uh, bit error is on both the row and the column. It's in the, it's in the intersection of both of them. So when the receiver uh, checks the parity bits, it finds an error in this column and in this column. Therefore, it says, okay, uh, the intersection of the row and column that parity error has occurred must be the bit that has been flipped therefore it has to uh, flip it again to correct uh, the error we have talked about internet checksum so we don't know we don't want to uh, spend more time on it another method of error detection is called cyclic redundancy check 
So in this method, we uh, use a remainder of a division to figure out whether an error has occurred or not. So the basic idea is both the sender and receiver uh, will keep uh, a, a number called the generator, G in this case. And, you know, this G has R plus 1 bits and the part that we, the redundant bits that we attach to the original data and send it to the unreliable uh, physical link uh, has only R bits. So the number of bits in G is one more than the number of bits in uh, the redundant uh, bits that are sent along the, the original data. So we have a very, very simple idea. If you uh, concatenate the data, the original data, with the R bits of uh, redundant data, which we call it CRC bits, because the method is called cyclic redundancy check. If you con concatenate D and R, you get a number, uh, you get a binary number called DR. And the R is chosen by the sender in a way that it is exactly divisible by G, where G, as I said, is called generator, which is known to both sender and receiver, which is known to both sides of the uh, link. So this should be divisible by G. So D and R should be this divisible by R. If it's not divisible, then the receiver can detect uh, errors. Now, the only question in CRC is that how sender can find out the value of R and uh, add the value of R to D and send them all together uh, through the network. To understand that, uh, we skip some, uh, you know, algebraic uh, calculations. All you need to know is R, which is the redundant uh, bits that should be sent along D, uh, is obtained by uh, getting the remainder of division D times 2 to the power R by G, where R is the number of bits uh, in capital R and G is a R plus one digit binary number. A very important service that LinkLayer provides is uh, controlling multiple access to a single link. So we, in this uh, part of chapter uh, lecture, we'll talk about uh, how link layer can control the multiple access of different uh, hosts to a single link. Obviously, if uh, a channel is shared among uh, two or more nodes and they uh, simultaneously transmit data into that uh, shared channel, a uh, collision may occur. And if a collision occurs, uh, none of the nodes can transfer the data tr uh, successfully. To avoid collision or handle collision, there is a protocol, uh, there are many protocols called multiple access protocols uh, that we run in the second layer of computer networks. These protocols are distributed algorithms that determine uh, how nodes can share a channel and what do, should they do when a collision occurs. The ideal scenario for a multiple access protocol is uh, given a broadcast channel of rate R, if only one node wants to use that channel, then it can enjoy the rate R of the channel. And when M nodes uh, want to simultaneously transmit data on that uh, channel, they can each uh, get a R divided by M uh, rate. 
and then another ideal uh, condition for multiple access protocol is to be fully decentralized which means that we don't need to have any uh, coordination between uh, nodes and there should not be any centralized uh, controller and no synchronization of clocks and slots and it has to be a simple protocol so that we would not have a lot of uh, complexity running that protocol on every host of the uh, computer network there are three classes of uh, uh, the mac protocols or multiple access uh, protocols one is called channel partitioning in this uh, type of protocols we have to partition channel either over time or over frequency uh, so that it can be shared among uh, multiple uh, you know users so in fact every partition uh, is dedicated to one uh, host or one end system in another uh, class we have random access um, multiple access uh, protocols uh, in these protocols uh, the channel is not divided and it allows uh, allows it allows collision however it also has some mechanisms for recovering from collision and in the last uh, protocol uh, type we have uh, the protocols who uh, uh, the, we have the we have protocols in which nodes have to take turns uh, before uh, transmitting uh, over the shared uh, resource over the shared um, link so one of the ways of doing channel partitioning for multiple access protocols is to uh, partition by time it's called tdma time division multiple access uh, and it means that uh, a channel is uh, completely dedicated to uh, one host at a certain time slot like for example here if we have six different uh, stations using the same uh, link uh, the first station has to have the uh, link for uh, one sixth of a second and in the second sixth of a second the second uh, host will enjoy the full um, capacity of the link then the third one then the fourth one then the fifth one then the sixth one but the problem with this method is that when uh, only t uh, is when we only have uh, a few in this case uh, three active uh, hosts and the other three are idle and they don't transmit any data into the network therefore half of the link capacity is lost and wasted a similar method to tdma is called fdma which means frequency division multiple access instead of partitioning the um, link into uh, equal size time slots we multiple uh, we partition it into equal size frequency bands and again we have the similar idea in fact now every host can enjoy uh, one sixth of the bandwidth of the link forever it's not limited to one time as thought it can have it forever but uh, at all the times the the capacity of the link that it enjoys is uh, one sixth of the original uh, link capacity and then we have uh, more exciting protocols which we call them random access protocols uh, in random access protocols we allow uh, collision but we do our best to uh, minimize collisions or even a collision ha occurs uh, we deal with the collision uh, reasonably and uh, efficiently 
In this class of random access protocols, we'll talk about uh, slotted aloha, pure aloha, or unslotted aloha, or sometimes we simply call it aloha. And then CSMA, and then we'll talk about CSMA uh, collision detection and collision avoidance uh, techniques. In the slotted aloha, we assume that all frames have the same size and the nodes start to transmit only at the beginning of a time slot and nodes are synchronized means there's a clock that synchronizes the nodes and if two or more nodes transmit in a slot all nodes detect collision so they all figure out that uh, something wrong has happened and here is the operation of a slotted aloha when a node uh, obtains fresh frame it transmits it uh, in next slot without caring about uh, whether the link is busy or not uh, then there are two cases in this situation if no collision happens on that time slot then everyone is happy node can send new frame in the next time slot or any time that uh, a new frame is available but if a collision happens, node has to retransmit the frame. But the question is, should it transfer it in the next time slot or should it wait for the next two time slots or should it wait for uh, 10 more time slots to be passed and then send it? That's a question. Uh, to decide which time slot the node retransmit the uh, frame again we do run a you know a stochastic experiment node retransmits a frame in each subsequent slot with probability p until a success happens so what does it mean what does it mean that uh, we send the probability p until the success happens Let's assume that P is equal to 1 divided by 6. What does it mean? It means that uh, in order to retransmit the data to the frame, the node has to uh, throw a die and only retransmit the frame if uh, a 6 appears. If 1 appears, 2 appears, 3 appears, three, 4 appears, or 5 appears, it doesn't retransmit it only if a six appears. If six doesn't appear at the uh, in the next time slot, then it has to wait for one more time slot to pass, and then it has to uh, throw the die again and again until at some point six appears and you know it uh, retransmits the frame, and hopefully if no collision happens again then uh, the node would be done with uh, transmitting that frame here is an example let's assume that we have three nodes sharing a link uh, at the first slot at the first time a slot they all send their frame and since they all send a collision uh, a collision occurs so c stands for collision in a time slot in the second time slot none of these nodes uh, sent as i said that's a random experiment the pro to, with the probability of p in this case p should be one over three so with the probability p uh, they try their chances so as you see here none of them uh, gets lucky and no one um, retransmits so this is an idle uh, time slot it's empty e stands for empty the third uh, time slot again we have collision because uh, nodes one and two they both decide to retransmit their uh, collided frames again at the same time so for the second time one and two collide then in the next time uh, time slot two tries again but one and three don't try again so two can successfully uh, retransmit this data because two is the only uh, 
you know node that uses this uh, time slot to transfer data so as you see s stands for success then the next time a slot is empty the the, the other the next one is uh, uh, the next one contains collision because both one and three wants to send their packets then uh, the next slide is the next slot is empty the next slot is uh, filled by uh, one transmitting its data and the last one is when uh, the note number three finally succeed in transferring its uh, frame so although the slotted aloha is simple and also although the slotted aloha uh, is highly decentralized and only slots in nodes need to be uh, in synchronization with each other but it has some um, uh, drawbacks too for example uh, we have a lot of collisions as you see in this example and then we waste a lot of time slots as you see there are empty slots here and a lot of uh, idle slots and then our nodes may be able to detect collision in less time uh, to retransmit packet however as you see here when uh, for example one and two detect uh, collision they don't retransmit data until uh, the next time slot so there's a lot of time that is wasted it is not necessary to understand the math beyond it but it is uh, easy to prove that uh, the maximum efficiency of a slotted aloha is 1 over e where e is the uh, Euler constant and it's equal to 30 almost 37 uh, percent so at best uh, and in long run not normally in long run and at best uh, a slotted aloha has the uh, efficiency of 37 percent meaning that the channel used for useful transmission of on uh, is used for um, uh, useful transmissions only 37 percent of the time the other 63 percent of the time uh, this the, the resources are wasted if you want to try to um, make uh, a slotted aloha non-synchronized and remove the effect of clock and the time slots uh, we have a protocol called pure aloha or on a slotted aloha in pure aloha uh, when a frame arrives uh, it is transmitted immediately and when a collision happens it means that we have two uh, uh, possible cases in the first case uh, the collision may happen uh, like this when you're sending this frame but some other node at a later time starts uh, sending another frame and these two frame yellow and purple collide the next uh, the second case then the second case for collision is when uh, node i decides to send a frame uh, when another node previously has a started but not finished sending its frame over the same link so as you see uh, the, there are two possible cases in which we can have uh, collision and uh, it is interesting in the next slide you'll see that uh, the chance of collision becomes double which means in pure aloha the, the, the you know the the uh, the frames uh, collide uh, twice as frequent as uh, a slotted aloha so since uh, the chance of collision doubles the efficiency uh, becomes half 
and now the efficiency is around 18%, which is even worse than uh, the slotted aloha. Another protocol is called CSMA, Carrier Sense Multiple Access. Uh, in this process, the nodes listen before transmitting on the link. If they listen and the link is busy, they don't transmit because if they transmit, it creates collision. But if the channel sends idle, then it transmits the entire frame. But again, as I said, if the channel sends busy, it differ transmission. It's like uh, a polite person who doesn't talk when others talk. So the human analogy is don't interrupt others. Although in CSMA nodes first listen and then transmit, but collision may still occur. And here you can see the reason why. Let's assume that uh, in this diagram we have uh, time in the vertical uh, axis and a space in the hor uh, horizontal axis. So let's assume that uh, we have four hosts uh, that are using a horizontal horizontal link and uh, the horizontal link is shared among them. Uh, here is uh, and then let's assume that at time t, uh, t sub zero, uh, this host start transmitting information on the uh, shared link. So as you see, the data is propagated through the link. So you can think of it like this, when the data starts uh, getting propagated over the, um, you know, the shared link. But at the time that, uh, uh, you know, but uh, at a later time, like T, T sub 1, uh, this host uh, wants to start sending uh, a frame on the same link. But uh, since this data has not yet been propagated and uh, sent by this node, this node thinks that uh, it is the first person who start transmitting data on, on a shared link, so uh, it doesn't, uh, you know, defer transmission of its frame. It simply starts uh, transmitting too. So when they both start transmitting, at some point, their you know, their data, their, their transmission uh, collide. And here is when uh, it happens, right? But again, uh, neither this host nor this host, uh, this host, they don't know uh, whether uh, a, you know, a collision has happened. They only uh, know when the, when the uh, other uh, when the other, uh, you know, transmission uh, from the other host reaches uh, their own computer. So, for example, uh, the first time that this computer uh, understands that a collision has occurred is this time. This time. Is it like T sub 2? Why? Because this is the time that this black line this, uh, you know, black line uh, meets the computer. This is a computer, this is the black line. So the intersection would be this point, and this is the time T sub 2. Same thing for uh, this, uh, same thing for this computer. This computer around this point at a later time, like T sub 3, understands that a collision has occurred so when a collision has occurred, the entire packet transmission time has been wasted. So that's not good. But we cannot do anything about it because we checked at the beginning of uh, uh, data transmission and we sensed and both, uh, you know, both computers checked and they sensed no uh, 
extra signals on the link and then they say okay the signal is free I, the the link is free it's all mine i start transmitting data but the the truth was uh the uh, when this uh, computer starts uh, transmitting the frame uh, the link was not empty and before that this computer has started had started uh, its own transmission of uh, data on the shared link so based on uh, the propagation delay and transmission delay and other factors we can find out the collision probability in CSMA protocol. As I showed you in the previous uh, plot, uh, each of the uh, hosts who, uh, whose messages got collided, whose frames got collided, uh, at some point in time will figure out uh, the collision, they detect, will detect the collision, and the smart thing is that uh, the, as soon as they sense the collision, they have to stop uh transmitting data over the link because that's going to be wasted right so in this figure it's uh, more clear because it's uh drawn with it's drawn with uh, the, the yellow and uh, red color so uh this computer the computer uh, the right hand side computer will figure out that the collision has occurred at this point and it takes them some time, a little bit of time, uh, to abort the transmission process. Same thing for this computer. It's figured out collision a little bit later, but again, it takes it a little bit of time before uh, stopping transmission. When it is stopped transmission, as you see, this line occurs and this would be the last bits that uh, you know this computer has transmitted over the uh, link so they have to abort the transmission because all the transmission is going to be wasted so it's better to trans to abort it sooner and there's a the important uh, step that CSMA has to take when uh, it aborts the transmission, uh, it has to, you know, uh, back off a little bit, which means that it has to enter a binary exponential back off uh, state, which means that uh, since a collision has occurred, it should not try its chances immediately, it has to uh, wait before uh, starting its chances the number the amount of time that uh, the uh, you know the computer has to wait before uh, retransmitting its information is a random number and it depends on the number of collisions that has occurred if uh, this is the nth uh, collision then uh, the uh, adapter or the uh, network in the interface card has to choose the random number k uh, from the interval 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to the power m minus 1. And then after choosing that k, it has to wait k times 512 bit times. And after it waits, uh, it has to again uh, sense the channel it has to go to the second step which means sensing the channel to see if it's empty or not if it's empty then it transmits uh, data otherwise it has to wait until the channel becomes idle and this process continues here you see uh, the estimation of efficiency for uh, CSMA as you see, the efficiency depends on uh, the tier propagation, the delay of propagation, and the delay of uh, transmission. If the delay of propagation is zero, then the efficiency becomes one. Why? Because when propagation is uh, super, super fast, then uh, collision detection becomes super fast. And uh, if the collision detection becomes super fast, we waste no time.
it means that uh, the efficiency would uh, converges to one will will could converge to one in the same uh, in a similar uh, situation if uh, the delay of transmission is very very higher than the delay of propagation then again it's like saying that the propagation delay is negligible as i said uh, the collision detection becomes super fast and no uh, resources uh, wasted therefore the efficiency also converge to uh, also converges to one but in reality the uh, efficiency is not one obviously it's uh, less than one and uh, the good thing that we can say about CSMA is uh, normally and usually it has a better performance than Aloha and it's a simple cheap decentralized protocol Similar to the IP protocol, which uh, specifies any host with 32 bits, the link layer protocol has to also address uh, the, the computers and, you know, the systems. Uh, we have a MAC address for this purpose. The MAC address is 48 bits, so it's uh, 16 bits large, lo longer than the IPv4 and obviously it has a much larger address space and here is how we can represent a mac address as you see uh, we write it in hexadecimals and then it becomes uh, six pieces of uh, two digit hexadecimal numbers so the important thing about uh, mac addresses is that each adapter has a unique address and that address is uh, burned on the hardware of the device so that it will not change for the whole lifetime of that device in order to guarantee the uniqueness of mac addresses it has to be administered by some organization in this case ieee so any manufacturer uh, who wants to have some unique mac addresses they have to buy a portion of mac address space um, and as i said it's similar to ip address but it's uh, different in a sense that mac addresses are like social security number of people they won't change uh, if they if their addresses uh, if their you know postal addresses uh, changes uh, for example if uh, I go from uh, one house to another if I move from one house to another my postal address change but my social security number doesn't in the same way if you uh, bring your laptop to school uh, the MAC address of your laptop won't change but the IP address of your laptop changed because it was previously connected to your home and your home has a certain IP address but now you're at the school it has a different IP address sometime in the subnet you know the IP address of a host but you don't know uh, what's the MAC address of its interface uh, to find out there is a protocol called ARP address resolution protocol there's an ARP table at each IP node uh, that can store a number of IP MAC address mappings uh, for uh, certain nodes. So for each uh, address mapping, we have it, uh, you know, uh, three tuple, a uh, triple. Uh, the IP address, MAC address, and TTL. TTL stands for time to live, which means that uh, this mapping of IP to MAC is not permanent. It has some, it has some time to live. Usually, after 20 minutes, uh, this mapping gets expired, and you know the IRP has to uh, confirm whether. Uh, the, the computer with a certain MAC address has 
been disconnected from the IP address or it is still or it is still connected to the IP address. Here you can see a few details about ARP. First, if uh, node A wants to send a datagram to node B and B's MAC address uh, is not in A's uh, ARP table or it was before but now it's expired, in any case, A broadcast ARP query packet containing B's IP address and then uh, when B receives ARP packet, it replies to A with its uh, MAC address and then A uh, saves and caches that IP to MAC uh, mapping for a certain uh, time to live, for example 20 minutes and it's uh, important to know that ARP is plug and play and it doesn't need any initialization. Here you can see an example uh, of um, uh, you know, multiple different adapters in uh, a computer network uh, located on different IP addresses.